it's important for me to have some kind of way to check reality because I might think that what I've said to somebody is just my passing comment of how I feel and I might not mean it judgmentally. I say things that I don't really realize are a problem and then I find out later that they're a huge problem. I might not realize till the next day, the next week, whenever I find out that I've offended somebody. So one good thing for me is to have somebody to sound some of these things off on and get a perspective of reality from another person's opinion. Um, and of course, if I'm more anxious, I'm more likely to blurt these things out. If I am less anxious, then I'm more likely to be able to filter myself and say, this is, I'm not sure about saying this, so let me not say it. When I go to massage or chiropractic, it's great that Dr. O'Malley allows this. Um, any kind of body work, um, it, it does depend how well I know the practitioners, but there's, I can, with Dr. O'Malley, I can talk about things before we start and to some extent on the table. I ask my patients, my clients, uh, questions about stress level, feelings, emotions, uh, work, exercise that probably other chiropractors don't include in their usual treatment or conversation. Some of Debbie's stressors are biochemical. So she, not only is she experiencing outside chemical stressors that we all experience, but she's experiencing internal biochemical stressors and through adjustments, her body can function better and help her own biochemistry help her. Also physically keeping her feeling better keeps her stress level down and keeps her body working better, keeps her out exercising more so that she makes her own chemicals that help her feel more relaxed and less stressed and functioning better in her life. And so those people, although it's not as much talk therapy as my psychiatrist, it is still a therapy. And all, all these anxieties go into my body. And then when my body's in feeling pain, then I get more anxious again. And it's a vicious cycle. So the... The body mind professionals help with some of that. I like making people feel better. And like when I work on Debbie, I love it because I've seen the transformation of Debbie has been astronomical. I mean, she's lost a lot of weight. She doesn't have as many mood swings. I mean, these are my observations. She's much happier. Um, she just seems to be more vivacious and alive than she was when I first met her. So. To me, that's just really rewarding. The focus tends to be on what's wrong with your brain, um, and uh, you're sort of stuck in that role of this mind-body um, duality. And what we've tried to do is step back from that and, and say, you know, we're working with people, and they have a whole life. You know, they have a spiritual life and an emotional life and a physical life and a social life. And what can we do to support um, growth and development in those areas for people. Because I think often what happens when people are diagnosed with a mental illness, we forget that they're people and we focus on their brain and medications and, um, you know, then when they get back into trying to live their lives, the focus has often tended to be just on helping them go back to work. But there's more to life than going back to work. There's friendships and relationships and physical health. And so our services, we've tried to uh, provide services that focus on all aspects of, of being a, of being a person in our in our society. It was the fall of 1991 that I had my first major episode of depression, but it really started in January of 1991 with the Gulf War. But I began to feel this uneasy sense of uh, security, safety issues. And there were a series of major events that literally hit me like a flood and overwhelmed me with despair, uh, including the death of my birth father, who I was trying to establish a relationship with, um, the burning down in the terrible Oakland, Berkeley firestorm of my birth house, where I grew up as a little child, and a number of series of events talking to my daughter about 
the abuse from my mother. And my daughter was 15, the same age that I was when my mother died. And I was overcome with um, despair and had no idea what was happening to me. I think all segments of the population are at risk for mental illness. I think clergy have a different role. We don't have a vocation that has an eight to five job or when you finish such and such, your job is done. We're really called to a lifestyle, to a vocation. And for many of us, it's very difficult to set healthy boundaries. And for many of us, clergy self-care is something that we do not practice and so people don't take sabbaticals, they don't take their days off, they don't do the things that are necessary to take care of themselves, whether it be healthy eating or exercise or whatever. Consequently, many of our clergy do struggle with high, high stress, and that can also lead to, uh, to depression. They're trying to meet the needs of, of congregations, some of which can be very difficult, leaders of congregations, there can be a lot of animosity and, and, and trying to do many, many roles that clergy have to do, not only preaching and caring for the congregation, but handling the financial and construction and uh, the administration of a business, really. There's so many roles, and it's hard to know when to say no. And we have a difficult time doing that. And so I think we are more vulnerable at times if we don't practice self-care. And that was really one of the lessons that I've learned through my journey with, with depression, and is that if I don't practice good self-care, that I will pay the price. And so I have learned to set healthy boundaries. I very difficult, but I've learned to say no, and I've learned that when I feel overwhelmed that there's things I can do that can be hobbies like gardening or walking or playing with my dogs that will be healthy and, and will be uh, relaxing and help move, move me out of that place. We try to teach families that too. To, you know, to get through hardship, you have to look after yourself. Your, your own life is, is a priority as much as your life as a caregiver. And if you don't take care of the caregiver, then the caregiver is going to give out. And so you have to be thinking about what you need to put in your life that is solace, which is activity, which is exercise, which is joy. Don't let those things go from your life because you're having a hard time. You don't have to be sacrificed, you see. So for all of us, we have to... I get up every morning and I walk three miles because I know that is the most stabilizing activity of my day. And then I'm awake and I'm energized and I've taken care of myself and I can go into the day and, and, and love the day. As a matter of fact, I just kind of went, went, went through having an episode. It's very scary, you know, uh, not being able to sleep or to find myself at a place where I can't get up. I can step back and go, okay, we need some sort of medical intervention. We, we need some intervention. First things I do is call all my friends that are my support system and say, I'm not doing well. And call work, I'm not doing well right now. Um, I need something else and that try to get that medical attention and, and, and try to get that support. And it works, you know? People told me it's gonna be okay, we're gonna be all right. My wife, because we've been through this and she knows a little bit about what to expect. One of her first responses to me was, you know, we've been through this before. It's going to be okay. We're going to be all right. It's very comforting. And it's a very different experience than being brought in by the police. <laughs> you know, it's very empowering for me to say, okay, wait a minute. I need to do something here. I need some help. I need to reach out. But yeah, it's very scary. You know, you always kind of got in the back of my mind, am I going to get so sick that I can't work anymore? Did the medication stop working? Are we going to have to try something new? These are not fun experiences. I mean, recovery isn't easy. Anybody that said recovery takes a lot of courage, it takes a tremendous amount of courage. I have such admiration for consumers and family members that have walked this path because I know how tough it is. Tremendous amount of courage to kind of keep going and keep asking and not giving up. And men of faith have courage.